hopefully we're live right now here coming to you from Bryce Canyon National Park for another Bryce Canyon Live session. So today is the first day of National Park Week and I'm Ranger Peter here to welcome you to what we're calling Junior Ranger Day, the first day of celebration as part of National Park Week. You can go online, search for National Park Week and find events that are going on all around the country at other national parks, part of Find Your Virtual Park, so ways to experience your parks from home. For Junior Ranger Day here at Bryce Canyon, we're going to be basically completing an activity in our Junior Ranger book. Now, this is going to be found in the Junior Ranger book here, and page 5 of this Junior Ranger book is a crossword. Now, you don't have to have this crossword with you now, but if someone wants to visit our website at nps.gov uh, NPS slash brca, you can click on learn about the park, kids and youth, and be a junior ranger. If you click those, you'll find our junior ranger book. And you can download it. By watching the program today, you'll have gotten all the answers you need to complete this crossword. So you can re-watch this video when it goes on our Facebook page and have all the answers there. Uh, otherwise, you can just follow along and learn about Prairie Dogs, which is what we're going to be focusing on today and what this crossword is about. We actually thought that it would be snowing outside today, uh, and so we're here now in our park museum. And since the park is closed, it's very quiet here in the Park Museum, and we're able to enjoy it for ourselves. What? You see something behind me? What was it? An animal? Huh. Could it have been a prairie dog, maybe? Let's be really quiet and see if we can get the prairie dog to come back up. Oh, it's actually making some vocalizations right now, some calls. It may be talking about us and the fact that we have visitors here for the prairie dog calling. Well, let's stay really quiet and let's see if we can get the prairie dog to come out a little bit further. Let's see, I'll, I'll walk away a little bit. Oh, it's coming out. Oh, yeah, okay, so it's perched up looking around. Basically seeing if there's any danger around the colony right now. I don't think it sees anything. So we're keeping our distance. Up, oh, and it's heading off, probably to go find some grass to eat. And we'll talk about what prairie dogs eat. And maybe we'll see that prairie dog come back out in the program a little bit later. In the meantime, we have Ranger Jesse behind the camera, who's going to be watching for all of your questions. So. During the program, if you have a question about prairie dogs, please feel free to type it in. And then at the end of the program, we'll take some of those questions and uh, do our best to answer them. So, like I said, I'm Ranger Peter. And as a ranger, wink wink, this might be one of the answers to your Junior Ranger crossword. As a ranger, I work in the park and I help to protect prairie dogs and keep them safe. So. Let's get into the good stuff and learn about prairie dogs, the things that we know about by studying them and observing them here in the park and elsewhere. So, what is a prairie dog? Is a prairie dog actually a kind of dog? Hmm, it's a good question. I've got a skull here of an actual kind of dog, a coyote. This would be called a canid. And if we're looking at the canid skull here, you can see it has long, sharp, teeth here, incisors that can tear apart meat. Usually canids are meat eaters, kind of a long snout on this animal here. Uh, just like your pet dog, if you have one at home, your pet dog would also be a canid, a true dog. Now a prairie dog is a little bit different. Let's look at its skull to kind of get an idea of how it's different. So the prairie dog skull you can see here They've got these sharp incisors right at the front, but that's almost it. They're almost like scissors right at the front of the prairie dog's mouth. 
And it's got a couple molars back here that it can use to grind up plant matter, but its primary teeth are right up front, these incisors. And this kind of teeth is what gives us a clue to what prairie dogs really are. They're not dogs, they are rodents. And rodents are mammals, like dogs, so they are warm-blooded, they have fur, they provide milk for their babies, and they usually give birth to live young, so not in eggs, but they'll give birth to live babies. Um, but with rodents, these front teeth, these incisors, never stop growing. Throughout their whole life, they just keep getting longer and longer and longer. So rodents include other animals, and you can maybe shout out any that you can think of. I can think of rats, mice, squirrels, hamsters, porcupines. Those would all be kinds of rodents. Prairie dogs are actually a kind of ground squirrel. So it's a squirrel that doesn't live up in trees, but instead lives down on the ground, or in the case of prairie dogs, down under the ground in their burrows. And we're going to talk about those later. Now, the study of these animals, canids and rodents, um, how we separate them out and figure out how animals are related to each other, well, that's a science that we call, wink, wink, this might be another answer, zoology. And zoology would classify the prairie dogs that we have here as the Utah prairie dog. It's actually the smallest of all the different prairie dogs and there are five different prairie dogs that live in different parts of the country. But the Utah prairie dog, you're only going to find them here in southwestern Utah, in the area of Bryce Canyon. So, those teeth that are constantly growing longer and longer and longer. Because they keep getting longer, if the prairie dogs didn't do anything to wear them down, they'd eventually get so long that the prairie dog couldn't even use their mouth. So they have to constantly be wearing down their teeth to keep them sharp and in good working order. So what's one way that they're going to wear down their teeth? Yeah, that's right, by eating. So what do prairie dogs eat? Well, prairie dogs are herbivores. That means that they mostly eat plant material, like grasses and flowers. That's why prairie dogs live in meadows, like the one that we're standing near, where you can see grasses and flowers growing providing lots of food for the prairie dogs. Now, some of the prairie dogs out there, I don't know if any of them are eating, but if you can spot one, you'll see that they like to take the grasses and the flowers and bend them over and just nibble off the top of them. By nibbling off the tops of the grasses and flowers, it's promoting new growth and encouraging the grasses and the flowers to constantly grow back thicker and stronger. The other thing they do with their little claws is that they're constantly digging all around these grasses and flowers and kicking up the dirt. And what this does is provide new areas for seeds to fall and grow. It also attracts insects to the open dirt and lots of different animals that like to come to eat those plants and eat those insects. So in your crossword, you're gonna find a question about some plants that grow within the park. And one of them is called a sago lily. You might see this growing out in the meadows out near the prairie dogs. So that's a sago lily, a very beautiful flower that grows here at Bryce Canyon. And you might also see a flower called an evening primrose. And that looks like this, a beautiful yellow flower that's pretty common here at Bryce Canyon. So what kind of plants are the sago lily? and the evening primrose. What do you call a plant that looks like that? That's right, you would call it a flower. So sago lilies and evening primroses are examples of flowers that grow here in the park. That might be useful to know later. Let's talk about another plant that you might see near the edges of the prairie dog colonies. This one looks like this. So it's got green leaves that are thick and rough, and little red berries or droops, little fruits that are growing on that plant. Now this plant's name comes from these little red fruits that are growing on it. And we call them little apples, but the thing is this plant's name isn't in English, it's in Spanish. And so who knows how to say apple in Spanish? 
Wait a second, maybe someone can type that one in. I'll be, I'll be impressed with that one. Tricky one. Any answers coming in, Ranger Jesse? Okay, I may have stumped all of our viewers. To say apple in Spanish, you would say manzana. And I said that this plant is called the little apple, and so that would be manzanita. M-A-N-Z-A-N-I-T-A. -A -A. Manzanita, another plant that you might see out in the areas near our prairie dog meadows, which are pretty much just past the visitor center. So very easy to find when you come and visit the park here. So one idea that's going to come up with prairie dogs when we talk about them is the idea of a keystone species. So this means that the animal is so important to the environment in which it lives and to the other animals that live there, that without them there you see the environment start to change and the plants and animals that would normally live there might not live there anymore. You could think of a beaver as a keystone species. Beavers build dams, and then the dams will back up water and create wetland habitat for animals that might not normally get to live in that area before the beaver does its work. So we talked about how the prairie dogs, when they're out in the meadow, eating the grasses and the flowers and digging up, can help promote new growth and lots of plants to grow there. So there are some animals that are going to come to the meadow because the prairie dog is there encouraging lots of grass for them to eat. So the first one of these animals is an animal that grazes, that is, it eats the grass kind of near the prairie dog colony. It has hooves, and it has long ears. Now, this animal is actually the exact animal that Bambi was based upon in the Bambi movies. What kind of animal is Bambi? Right, Bambi is a deer, and actually Bambi is a mule deer. They actually based Bambi on the mule deer um, so that it would be a deer that people were familiar with in the United States. They're called mule deer because like mule, they have those long ears. And uh, I may have a picture here that we can share with you, show you the mule deer. You can see these long ears. I think that they're pretty cute. Yeah, so long ears. So the mule deer is an animal you might see grazing near the prairie dog colony. Now the second one, you can actually look back here in the meadow and see it. That's the first clue. It's a lot faster than a mule deer. Here's a close-up picture of this animal. It has huge nostrils right here that it can use to breathe in lots of air and fuel big lungs and muscles that allow it to run very, very, very fast, up to 60 miles an hour. It's about as fast as your car can drive on the highway. And you would see these animals mostly only out in the meadows where the prairie dogs live. The mule deer, uh, they like to go in the forest and find food there too, but this animal, is pretty much only out in the open because it likes to use big open spaces to reach those really fast speeds. The other thing about this animal that I'll show you is that it has very large eyes. It can use these eyes to see long distances so that it can see predators from far away. It also has white hairs on its butt that it can flick up like this and warn others of these animals of danger from far away so that they are warned and can start to move away. You could even think that the prairie dogs and this animal might work together to be able to warn each other if there are predators in the area. The final clue for this animal, and feel free to type it in if you know who this is, unlike deer who have antlers, this animal has horns. And these horns have little nubs there, we call them prongs. These little parts on the horn right there that stick forward. And really, I've kind of given you everything you need to know the name of this animal. Have we gotten any guesses, Jesse? Yeah? Who got it right? Misty got it right. Misty got it right. This is the pronghorn. 
And you might find in your crossword in your Junior Ranger book that it asks about the fastest land, an land animal in North America. Well, as far as on land goes, nobody is faster than the pronghorn. Again, they run up to 60 miles an hour, which is just amazing if you can see it out in the meadows here near Bryce Canyon. So let's talk about another way that prairie dogs are keystone species. Again, a way in which that they're so important to the animals and plants that live in Bryce Canyon that without them, things just wouldn't be the same. And to understand how they're important in this way, we're going to go and take a question from Jude in Southern California. Why are prairie dogs so alert? Yeah, the question was, why are prairie dogs so alert? Well, the answer to that one is basically that they have to be. Pretty, there's quite a lot of animals that like to eat prairie dogs. Since that prairie dog we saw earlier, I don't think they're anywhere around. I've heard prairie dogs described as the chicken McNuggets of the prairie, just because so many different animals like to eat the prairie dogs. Um, this includes quite a different number of animals. Let's show you a couple and see if you know who these animals are. Here's the first one. Who knows who this animal is? I know we have to wait sometimes, there's a little delay. No guesses yet? This is a pretty fierce animal. Uses its claws to dig up. Luca got it right. <laughs> Luca got it right. Yeah, this is a badger. We have badgers in the park who like to eat the prairie dogs if they can catch them. Let's see, let's go to another one. This is a very special animal that we've been seeing a lot of recently. Actually, Ranger Jesse and our park superintendent both saw one of these in the park yesterday and today moving near the meadows where the prairie dogs live in the park. Let's see if anyone's got a guess as to who this animal is. This would be another canid. Donna, good job, Donna. Good job, Donna. Yeah, this is actually a red fox. And so we have those in the park that would certainly love to catch a prairie dog if they could. Let me show you a couple others. This one here is a long-tailed weasel. These live in the park, and actually this would be a long-tailed weasel in summer. In the winter here at Bryce Canyon, their entire coat will change to white so that they can be more camouflaged in the snow. So the question is, what's it like to hunt the prairie dogs in winter? Well, we'll talk about what the prairie dogs are doing in winter just a little later in our program. Here's another animal that is a predator of prairie dogs. Who can tell me who this is? They've got a little rattle. I gave a little away. But it's a noisy animal that you might see. A venomous reptile with a noisy name. Good job, Monica. Monica, yeah. This is a rattlesnake. Actually, the Great Basin rattlesnake is what we have here in the park. And let's look at one other predator of the prairie dogs. I've seen this bird perched up on trees near my cabin in the park, which is near a prairie dog colony. So this bird will sit up on a tall tree overlooking the prairie dog colonies, waiting for an opportunity to swoop down. Your crossword, you'll find that there's a large bird with an expensive sounding name that would be referring to this animal. The expensive sounding name. Nothing yet? All right, I'll give this one to all of you. This is a golden, that's the expensive part, a golden eagle. Actually, if we look up here, I think that there's actually one just above the prairie dog colony here, looking down on the prairie dogs, maybe waiting for their opportunity 
to swoop down. All right. So we've got all these different animals depending on the prairie dogs to provide food for them. But how does the prairie dog then protect themselves against these animals? Well, one way is with a very powerful bite. Again, when we're looking at this prairie dog skull and you look at those incisors at the front there, these teeth can deliver a very painful and powerful bite if those animals get too close. So that's a very handy way that they can protect themselves. Um, another way that they can protect themselves, we're going to go to another question. Let's see here. And this one's going to come from Ryan in Houston, Texas. All right, let's hear from Ryan. This is Ryan from Houston, Texas. Do prairie dogs bark? Do prairie dogs bark? That's a great question. So, the answer to what we call the sound that prairie dogs make is in fact a bark. Even though it sounds very different from the sound that a canid dog or your dog at home might make. Let's actually listen to the sound that we would call a prairie dog bark. Yeah, so it's kind of a cheeping and a chirping. I actually think it almost sounds more like a dog toy than a real dog. What might surprise you is that these little cheeps and squeaks that the prairie dogs are making or that the prairie dog made that came up from its burrow earlier in our program, that these sounds are the most complicated language system in mammals, other than ourselves, that we found by study. So prairie dog language is all the way up there with the language of dolphins uh, as well in terms of how complicated and complex it is. So in these little squeaks, even though they don't sound like much, scientists have found that these sounds are not just warning other prairie dogs that there's danger somewhere in the area. They're actually warning other prairie dogs about what that danger actually looks like, where it's moving, what color it is, what shape it is. They did one study where they had a person put on different colors of shirts and two different people of different heights also wearing different colors of shirts and walk near a prairie dog colony. And by listening to the sounds, they were able to see that the prairie dogs were not just saying, hey, there's a person nearby, but there's a tall person in a blue shirt, you know, moving about 50 yards away from the colony. So the prairie dogs were able to use that language to specifically describe what's near the colony. So if you come to Bryce Canyon National Park and you pull off on a roadside pull out and you're watching the prairie dogs from a safe distance and you hear them making that sound, there's a very good chance they're talking about you and describing maybe what you look like on that day. Maybe it would be a good idea in the morning before I come to work, I can go out and have the prairie dogs check my tie for me and listen to their squeaks. They can tell me whether or not I'm looking ready for work. So that's a prairie dog bark, and it's one of the ways that they are able to help protect the colony from predators by spreading the word in a very specific way so the other prairie dogs know exactly what to look out for. Another thing you might see the prairie dogs doing, there's one of them over here, I don't know if it's in the camera room here, Jesse, but a prairie dog with his arms up like this, they, they do these little yip jumps. And so prairie dogs that are on the lookout will sometimes do these yip jumps and other prairie dogs will do yip jumps back. And they believe that it's a way that the prairie dogs can basically say, hey, just check in to make sure you're keeping an eye out. Yep, I'm keeping an eye out. You can keep going on eating grass and finding food out there. So they've got little body movements as well as a very sophisticated language that helps them warn other prairie dogs about threats. So, um, we also know that the prairie dogs don't spend most of their time up above ground, right? They're not just up there looking for grass. There's a whole nother world going on under the ground. And so the other way that prairie dogs can protect themselves is after they warn each other that there's danger, they can escape underground and head down to their burrows. So we're actually going to move over and take a look at a prairie dog underground burrow and talk about what's going on over there. Yeah, these things. All right. So we'll get our camera ready on the burrow here. And I might need a flashlight to show you some of these 
areas. We should be done with that. All right. So here we are at an underground prairie dog colony. So we'll start at the very top. You can see up here that the prairie dogs have raised mounds on the ground. And that's the entrance and the exit to the hole where they can come in and out. It's actually very interesting. Not all of the entrances will be raised up like that. Some of them are just flat with the ground. And what this actually does is it changes the way that the air moves over the entrances to the prairie dog colonies. So when the air has to go over a raised mound, it's slower and the air pressure is lower. It creates a sucking motion. So it pulls air in from the lower entrances and exits elsewhere and helps pull it through. And so it's like air conditioning almost for the prairie dog colony and keeps fresh air moving down there. Now the other thing that this raised burrow entrance is going to do is help keep rain from flooding down into the prairie dog colony. And so there's a season here at Bryce Canyon Wink, wink, this might be another crossword clue, uh, where we get most of our rain. It's a two month period in the summer that we call our monsoon season. So the monsoon season in the summer, usually July and August, lots of rain falls down on the plateau meadows here. And so it's probably a good thing in some cases that there's a raised entrance so all that water doesn't flood down into the prairie dog colony. Let's go down a level into the prairie dog colony. So we're going to go down through the entrance here. In one of the first rooms down here, we've got a prairie dog within. And he's kind of tilting his ear. It's because he's listening. We call this room just below the ground where prairie dogs can listen for threats above, the listening chamber. Prairie dogs have really sensitive hearing, especially for really low frequencies. So these are sounds that can travel easily through the ground. And so the prairie dog can sit down there and be listening and maybe hear if something's moving around near the entrance of the burrow down there. It's a good place to keep a watch out. So if we continue down in the prairie dog colony, we'll find all these tunnels, different places, different rooms. Some of these tunnels are gonna go to other entrances and exits. Some of them are just gonna be dead ends. Actually right here, one of the prairie dog's predators, there's a snake down here in one of these rooms. So these prairie dog predators we talked about, especially like the weasel and the snakes, they can use the same colony as the prairie dogs. So they have to make sure that they build their colony in such a way that they've got enough room to escape or maybe send a predator down a dead end tunnel. There's a room all the way down here at the bottom. And this is the room that the prairie dogs use to keep the rest of the colony clean. It's the same how we have one room where we go to do number one and number two to keep the rest of the house clean. Then we also flush in that room. Yeah, that's right. There's a room for the prairie dogs just for their toilet. And so we call that room the toilet. And they go there to make their waste so that they don't spread it all throughout the rest of the colony. There's also a room where prairie dogs can go to sleep. So they've got a little bedroom. So they'll sleep there, you know, during the night, like we do. The prairie dogs are active in the day, and they'll sleep at night. It's also where they go in the winter, usually from about November to March, and they enter a state where they lower their heart rate and their body temperature so that they require less food, less energy to make it through the winter. So think about what do we call it when animals do this in the winter, where they lower their body temperature and heart rate. It's not exactly sleeping, it's a more intense form of sleeping. They're going through big changes in their body so that they can make it through the winter. Let's see, Ranger just said, let's see if anyone can chime in and tell us what that's called when they go through the winter with a lower body temperature and heart rate. Donna, good job, Donna. Donna, coming through, very good. Yeah, hibernation is that period, usually from November to February or March here at Bryce Canyon, the prairie dogs will enter a state of hibernation. It's always the male prairie dogs that are first to come back up. Usually in February, the past couple of years, we've seen them coming up 
They want to be up first because they want to be the first one to meet a female prairie dog. And uh, so that they have their first chance to make baby prairie dogs. So we call the process when the male and the female prairie dog meet to create baby prairie dogs. Again, this might be a clue. They mate. So when prairie dogs mate, that starts a process that's going to lead to a baby prairie dog. The prairie dog's mating season, kind of when they mate to make baby prairie dogs, uh, it's about an hour long. Uh, it's one day for about an hour. So the female prairie dog basically sends a signal, I'm ready to mate, and they take care of it. So it's very short window. So those male prairie dogs are making sure they're up early, they're alert, they're ready to meet a female prairie dog to create baby prairie dogs. So there's a question in there about these groups of prairie dogs and how many male prairie dogs you're going to find in a group. Well, you might have lots of females and baby prairie dogs, but the answer to how many males you're going to find in a group is just one. So the males may move from group to group, but once a male has picked a group, we call it a coterie. That male is basically sticking with that group for that time being, and there won't be another male allowed in there. So when we're talking about the mating season, they mate, and then 30 days, about one month later, the little prairie dog is forming inside the female prairie dog, and then they give birth. So the young prairie dogs, if you wanted to go underground and find where they'd be, you'd want to go to the room over here that we call the nursery. Some little prairie dogs in there being fed by their mom. So just like human babies, they've got a nursery room within their home for the young prairie dogs. And we call the young prairie dogs, be another clue for your crossword, just like we call baby dogs, we would call baby dog a puppy or a pup. We call young prairie dogs pups. And so you'll see them coming up above ground usually right about now, April into May, because those first prairie dogs will mate in March usually, and then we'll start to see the smaller ones coming up uh, in the next month or so. So that'll be something to look out for. Hopefully when the park reopens, you know, you'll still be able to come in and they'll still be small. You'll be able to pull off on the side of the road and maybe look out and see the smallest prairie dogs among the bigger ones out there. So one thing I want to talk about is um, what you can do to help protect all these prairie dogs. Not just the baby ones, um, all the prairie dogs. So the Utah prairie dog I mentioned uh, is only found here in southwestern Utah. Prairie dogs in this country generally have had their range or the area that you can find them shrink a lot over the last 150 years as more and more people have moved into the western United States and changed the way that we use this land. So for some prairie dogs like the Utah prairie dog, their range has gotten so small that they were listed as a threatened species. So a place like Bryce Canyon National Park would be a place where we could try and protect these prairie dogs and give them a safe place to live. Outside the park, sometimes you see programs where people can be paid money to allow the prairie dogs to also live on their land and that this can help create more habitat for the Utah prairie dog. So they were thinking in the year 2000, so 20 years ago, that the prairie dog, the Utah prairie dog, would have gone extinct. But thankfully, due to programs like those at Bryce Canyon, We've got a good population of prairie dogs here in the park, and they're able to remain stable and to produce more and more prairie dogs. They're doing much, much better now. Probably the most important thing that you can do to help protect the Utah prairie dog when you're visiting the park is make sure that the car that you're riding in is one, going the speed limit, and two, there's a question in your crossword about cars that are prepared to do this can help save prairie dog lives? And the answer to that is going to be stop. Cars that are ready to stop can save a lot of prairie dog lives here in Bryce Canyon because unfortunately the prairie dogs like to spend some time out on the road, you know, sometimes just getting the warmth or maybe it's licking salt off the road that cars bring in on them uh, in the winter time. And so if you're going over the speed limit or not paying attention, it's very easy not to see these little animals on the road 
and to accidentally run over one of them. So we ask you to just be very careful when you're driving in the park, especially near the visitor center where we have most of our prairie dogs. One other thing that you can do to help protect the Utah prairie dogs here at Bryce Canyon is right here. This is to adopt a little Utah prairie dog. So this is a little stuffed prairie dog, has a nice Bryce Canyon Junior Ranger vest on him. And these are normally available in our visitor center, which is closed right now because the park is closed, but normally you can come into the visitor center and adopt a prairie dog and get a certificate to show that you've adopted them. Lucky for all of you, you can still do this even though the visitor center is closed. You can go online, you go to www.bricecanyon.org and that takes you to our Natural History Association's webpage. It's our park's nonprofit partner, and they have the Adopt a Prairie Dog program on their website there. So you can adopt one of these prairie dogs, have them mailed to you at home. They'll take that long journey in the dark to meet you, and uh, you could have a prairie dog all of your own and a certificate to show that you've adopted them. Why this program is great is that all the money that goes to adopting these prairie dogs will then go to the park and help us with protecting the Utah prairie dog here and helping to protect their habitat. So by adopting one of these stuffy prairie dogs, you can help protect real prairie dogs in the park. Of course, the real prairie dogs, when you visit them, you always want to remember to keep a safe distance from them. Don't walk out into the meadows at the park. You want to just observe them from the road where you can pull over. Give them lots of space um, so that we don't stress them out or uh, in any way harm them. So I'll put this little prairie dog here. Let's add him to the burrow back in here where he can be safe for the rest of our program. Okay, those are kind of the main things that I wanted to talk about um, with the Utah Prairie Dog here at Bryce Canyon. For those of you that do, from this program, end up completing your crossword with all the clues and answers I've given you, in this program. Keep in mind, uh, I'm going to grab my Junior Ranger book and I'll show you this. You can flip to the very back page. So again, on page five is where you would find the crossword that we did today. You can complete that. And then if you go all the way to the back to the maze activity, which is pretty cool, at the very bottom corner here there's an address. And that's the address for the park. And so if you complete your Junior Ranger book requirements after you print it off at home, or you can write to the park via email at brca underscore information at nps.gov, or just send us a Facebook message and we'll get it to them. We can mail you one of these books too, but when you've completed your activities, you can mail it to the park and then we will ship you back a Bryce Canyon Junior Ranger badge all of your own. So you can get a badge in part by doing the activity we did today. All right, Ranger Jesse, do we have any questions that came in that we can talk about? Yeah, so Misty asks, what is the scientific field that includes prairie dogs and all other animals besides humans? Yeah, so we talked about that one in the beginning, talking about canids and how we classify different animals and how they're related. That is zoology. Z O O. L-O-G-Y, yeah. What other questions did we get? Barrett asks, how deep do the burrows go? That's an awesome question. So actually, they've built this one pretty accurately, because I'm almost six feet tall, and about six feet is about as deep as the prairie dog colonies usually go. So if this was the ground and I dug a hole that I could stand in, I would probably be seeing the prairie dog colony go down just about that deep. Really good question. Any other questions coming? Yes, Misty also asks, what is the room that prairie dogs listen to the world above? Yeah, so we talked about that one as one of the first chambers that is right below the entrance of the prairie dog colony here. So if you came down, right below ground, you'd find what we call the listening chamber. And this is where prairie dogs can sit and hear the world above and hear danger coming from far away. So, I think that's all the questions that we got during the program. 
I so want to thank all of you for joining us here today for Junior Ranger Day as part of National Park Week. Again, if you go online and search for National Park Week, you can find the National Park Service's webpage where they've got events at all different parks throughout the country, virtual National Park Week events that you can participate in. Uh, if you go to our website or look on our social media, you can see a schedule of other Facebook Live programs that we have planned for the park for National Park Week. Uh, the next one we're scheduling is on Tuesday, and that's going to be for Transportation Tuesday. We're going to look at a historic bus and learn about how people visit the park by using transportation. And we really look forward to seeing you there. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us virtually uh, while the park is closed. Keep an eye on our park website at nps.gov slash brca. That's where we'll post all information related to park operations and when the park might be reopening as we know more in the future. I think I actually see that prairie dog on their way back, so I'm going to get out of the camera here and allow them to come in. So thanks again. Look forward to seeing you soon.